welcome everybody uh, to this panel discussion, Rewiring AI as part of Taming AI. I'm happy to host this one hour discussion uh, together with you that also marks the end of a series. And um, my name is Jasmine Grimm and I'm a curator and festival maker. And with me, I have the pleasure uh, to have Yasemine Keskentepe, Max Harich and Tiara Roxanne. Uh, today, we will discuss your various perspectives onto AI. And um, as the idea is also to close this series, we will take a more broader look uh, on AI and maybe also on some already addressed perspectives and find out in which way artists and creatives can shape the narrative around um, AI through your very own perspectives. So I would say let's do a short introduction round. Um, I know every one of you has prepared a, like a five minute introduction that gives us um, more insights into your work. And uh, let's start with you, Yasemina. You're a curator and a researcher who already worked a lot with AI. And we already met in the context of the AI biennial in Essen, and you created successfully the exhibition on artificial intelligence at the German Hygiene Museum in Dresden, and also curated the hybrid biennial in Hellerau and worked previously at the ZKM. Um, so already a lot of connections with the topic of AI. And uh, uh, you're also currently um, writing your PhD um, on a, a very interesting topic. Uh, maybe we have time to dig uh, also a bit into that. But now I would like you to give um, you the space to introduce uh, your work a little bit to us. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here and talking to all of you. So my name is Yasim. I'm a curator. Uh, I work at the intersection of media art and digital technology. So my uh, my work I my yeah my work critically engages with questions of how digital technologies are created and implemented, uh, what their impact is on sociality and politics, basically how they increasingly shape the reality that we live in. Um, a particular concern of mine has been algorithmic governance, so how especially um, public implementation, but also like, decision-making processes are supported by algorithmic systems and how power is exercised through that. So I'm interested in how narratives and imaginaries are constructed around um, technologies um, of like, on the one hand, the promises of progress and social inclusion, but how they are disguising uh, the exploitations, the extractive practices and um, discriminatory processes that are also inherent um, to them. Um, so I'm working around these, um, yeah, problematics. And um, so I'm also really interested in technological infrastructures, the material layers of data, data centers, energy politics, um, labor as well, labor conditions of uh, developing technologies, environmental concerns, um, yeah. So I worked across uh, many different formats. Uh, you mentioned a few and I brought a few pictures to highlight a few of these projects. So uh, as you touched upon, um, this is the Open Codes exhibition uh, back in 2016, feels like forever ago at uh, ZKM. Uh, here we looked at the prevalence of code and coding practices and how coding is um, shaping many, many aspects of uh, our, uh, our lives. And a really important aspect to this exhibition was also to create a space of exchange um, uh, where we wanted to support um, practice of mutual learning um, and create an interdisciplinary discussion, bring in diverse voices to um, share their insights. The, the other project I worked on um, and opened two years ago at the German Hygiene Museum is the exhibition on artificial intelligence specifically. The exhibition looked at artificial intelligence in a holistic way um, because it was meant for a general audience. Um, and working from the history of ideas to the workings of 
machine learning all the way to um, its applications, ethical debates, and futurities. Um, I've also been involved in different uh, like festival formats, starting with Algorithmic Superstructures, which was the 2018 edition of the Impact Festival, which I did with two amazing collaborators, Sasha Anikina and Luba Elliott. And then last year's Hybrid Biennale at Hellerau in Dresden, uh, working at the intersection of performance and media art and trying to um, work through ideas surrounding social, um, yeah, social fractures and reconnections um, across social, ecological and technological concerns. The last thing to mention, uh, currently I um, am working on the discourse program of Transmediale Festival happening in 2024. Um, yeah, so maybe let's leave it at that. Um, that's a little bit about me and what I've been doing in the last couple of years and I'd like to hear what all of you have been doing. Thank you so much, uh, Yasemina. Um, I would directly jump to the next speaker so we get to know a bit more about um, his work, uh, Max Harich, um, joining us from Budapest, as I heard at the moment. Uh, you are an artistic researcher, ethicist, and consultant with a focus on AI and NFTs. You studied communication science in Aachen and critical thinking at the University of the Underground, which um super curious about actually. And he founded the Munich Embassy of the Lithuanian Artist Republic, Ozupis. Um, I have questions. <laughs> and um, you said you build bridges between art and tech. And I was super happy to meet you um, as part of the New Now Festival where you exhibited Smart Hands. And um, I'm happy to see you here again. And um, yeah, maybe you can introduce us uh, into your work. I will try my best. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's a really big honor to be here with you. I'm, I'm not a, a coder. I'm not even qualified as an artist. My background is rather in linguistics, uh, which I think is a totally underrated um, discipline with regard to artificial intelligence. My fascination started like 15 years ago, just with the question, like, how do we understand anything? How does this brain work? How do we Uh, come to associate meaning with words, how does all this stuff work? And I think AI is a very good um, area to look into because at the moment, this is this is the area where such questions are raised and, and debated quite heavily. Um, so I wanted to start with this picture because I always get back to this question, what is this AI thing, uh, this artificial intelligence, and what is what would be a natural intelligence in comparison to this. And, and I love this uh, GIF animation of neurons. It's just brain neurons making connections right now. This is, these are learning neurons, living neurons. And this is what neurons do while we're listening to something like in this moment right now. And this is to me, I think whenever we talk about creating AI, it's about how are we going to create this exactly this and all the attempts of uh, bringing consciousness into AI and teaching it human values and stuff like this in the end it's trying to simulate this what you see right now with the calculator and uh, I think the, the biggest difference that you see here is, is that human intelligence is there's something going on and there's organic matter moving and something alive going on in, inside a body and I think this this embodiment is, is absolutely critical for what the current state of AI is capable of doing and what it is will never be capable of doing as long as we program AI in the way we do it right now. Um, so I also do installations and the Smart Hands installation, which I'm, I'm most proud of, and this is the, the one which we um, started some years ago and the first prototype was finished just uh, in the end of last year. and. Now we're trying to train it some more. This is Smart Hans. This is the digital reincarnation of a clever Hans, the horse that actually lived 100 years ago. Clever Hans story is really interesting because we had the case where people associated the most spectacular cognitive capabilities to a horse, but the horse actually didn't know nothing. They, they thought the horse could calculate numbers, know the birth date of the emperor and whatever, but in the end, The, the horse was just good at guessing and looking at faces and interpreting reactions. 
And in AI, we have the so-called clever Hans effect, which is dedicated to the source, which tells us that also even with AI as a black box, you can never know on which data the decision was based. And no matter how uh, sophisticated and expensive your AI model is, in the end, it will ever, always have this fatal flaw inside. So uh, I, I love to introduce Smart Hans as the end boss of all AI models as at the moment so far. And I see AI as something, as a technology, a very disruptive technology, which also creates new patterns, how we see the world, how we approach the world, and it's, it's changing the world rapidly. And I think it's important to see that AI is also, at the same time, it's mirroring ourselves. This is one of my favorite metaphors for AI so far, which is changing at the moment, which is AI as a magnifying mirror of human behavior. It looks at the things that we present to, to it, the, the maybe stereotypic pictures of how we treat each other, how we treat nature, what we eat, and so on, and takes these patterns and scales them globally uh, without knowing anything about what these patterns is. Sometimes it's patterns about like nutritional choices. Sometimes it's patterns about whom we should hate on social media or whatever. And this is just um, magnified without uh, real thinking or like consideration behind it. Just to get to the last point, because uh, all my work related to Ujupis is uh, trying to say, as humans, how can we take responsibility and have impact on this development at the moment? And to me, it always comes back to if we uh, accept this, this mirror metaphor, then it's always up to us. And we have to be a good role model and we have to, to teach the AI the right things. Of course, there's always still some like technical flaws which can still dis disrupt the, the, the processing of, of the ideas that we process. So we still have to watch the technology, but first of all, watch ourselves. Let's uh, go on to you, Tiara, um, the third panelist uh, today. You are a scholar and an artist based in Berlin. You're currently working as a postdoctoral fellow at Data and Society, developing protocols of trust and safety online for indigenous communities based in Central and South America. Your work is dedicated to rethinking the ethics of AI uh, through an anti-colonial and cyber-feminist lens. Uh, I was uh, lucky enough to see one of your performances at Republica many, many years ago, and um, I've been following up your work um, from that point on. And um, yeah, I'm really happy to have you here. And uh, yeah, please take us uh, more deeply into your work. Yeah, a bit about me. So as you mentioned, I'm a postdoc at Data and Society, and I'm particularly working with an indigenous community, uh, the indigenous community of Kauka in Colombia, where we're looking at the idea of trust in a material cosmological sense in order to think about what that means um, online. And so specifically working with ritual and indigenous cosmology and praxis or practices um, and really through the concept of the sacred. So that's a lot of my more present scholarly work is kind of the assertion, thinking about the assertion of indigenous communities online in general. Um, and from, you know, 2019, Yasmin, when you first saw, <laughs> you know, the, basically the beginning of my artistic career as like a performance artist, I was really looking at how artificial intelligence is as a digital territory and how that digital territory is colonized by uh, settler colonial tactics and the settler colonial gaze. So I not only argue, but I, but I look at ways in how artificial intelligence is embedded with settler coloniality or the white gaze. The beginning, uh, you know, several years ago, I started data colonialism and how indigenous communities in general in the Americas in North, Central and South America are left out of data sets as a means of, you know, settler colonialism, uh, extraction, uh, resource extraction and indigenous erasure. And so really unpacking data sets and looking for not only my identity, but others who identify as indigenous in the States, in Central and South America as well. I created a um, solo exhibition at Trinity Square Video uh, in Toronto 
And that was at the point, the beginning of the pandemic in March 2020. So we had to move my exhibition online within a week. So I created a data visualization of this project showing the misconceptions of data colonialism. Uh, Unfortunately, I can't show you now because it's been years and I kind of wanted to show more of my present work, which deals with um, the ethics of energy or energy ethics. You can see this photo here. Uh, So as a performance artist, create these kind of experiences that demand participants in the room acknowledge violences of settler colonialism more generally. But now I'm looking at how artificial intelligence is extracting um, territorial cosmological resources from indigenous land in order to promote our relationship with artificial intelligence. This um, kind of mirror, as Max was um, mentioning and reminding us of. Um, And so I'm kind of, in a way, trying to push the mirror back on the gaze and participants in the room. And so this photo is from my recent work called I Cannot Decolonize My Body Clay. And this is this was performed at Atelier Gardens early June in Berlin here this summer. I'm so grateful to have had this performance. I just also had this performance in Bogota at the University of the Andes um, just a few weeks ago. And in this performance, I eventually, um, yeah, critique and display the the, the work of, of extracting land. And I also eat the soil and eat the earth and regurgitate it as a means of um, showing how indigenous territory, post-settler colonialism, post-AI extraction be ingested or digested from an indigenous perspective or an indigenous body. Um, So I I really enjoy this performance. it's intense and at, at this particular one and at, at Atelier Gardens, a friend of mine said he couldn't stop watching it. It was like uh, watching a Black Mirror episode. It was devastating. He, he was part of the experience. It, it refuses, it demands, and it um, creates, I think, unsettling discomfort. Um, I think I'll stop there. That, that was pretty short, but I, I want to give us more time to talk uh, throughout the discussion. So thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Tiara. And um, I prepared uh, some questions uh, specifically to your practices, but I um, kind of want to start directly um, where we ended um, your performance and uh, the connection that you made um, uh, to AI and the territory and the idea of extractionism, because I see this concept also um, uh, in the work of you, Yasemina, that you've been uh, speaking about the political uh, uh, context of AI and its links to extractionism. And I also kind of see it in your work, Max, when you speak about um, AI uh, being the mirror of um, humanity, let's say. Uh, So it's also kind of extracting data and uh, mirroring it back. So I would be curious to to know more about this uh, different perspectives that you have on on this idea of AI being an extractive technology. Um, Would you agree to that? Or would you say um, AI could be also used in non-extractive ways and how would this look like? Really beautiful question um, and intense. Uh, thank you for asking that. So just generally seeing AI as extractive in the way that it extracts parts of humanness and mirrors it back to us, not necessarily humanness in an embodied sense, but more of a disembodied way. But I'm extractive in a way that it takes from um indigenous communities, indigenous land. And this goes all the way back to the concept of and how that has been colonized um, for so long that our interpretations of technology and intelligence would argue 
um, immediately to AI, uh, where we miss that or we overlook that technologies actually come from, in my perspective, indigenous cosmologies, um, you know, data mining and, and thinking about uh, historicity and counting time or telling time in a non-Western way. Um, in terms of thinking about artificial intelligence um, as a way that might not be extractive, that feels very optimistic for me in, in the present moment. Um, but I really like the feeling of that question and I would love to sit with that more. So that's all I've got in terms of answering that. Cool, thanks. Um, uh, maybe Yasmin, you, you also mentioned the concept of extractionism and I know that um, currently your research also uh, deals more with um, uh, ecological aspects of technology and how AI can shape new imaginaries. Um, um, is there a link for you um, between the concept of AI and extractionism and our relation to ecology, climate, and maybe the climate crisis? Yeah, I mean, there are many um, trajectories that can be drawn here, like the enormous energy consumption um, of the data centers themselves, but also in order to accommodate um, the enormous amount of data that we are producing, requiring new data centers to be built, and this coming to a clash, um, of course, with um, how and where these are built um, and where the energy is uh, cheapest, in, in essence, and where the land is cheapest, and that often um, clashes with minority rights. So that's one link that can be uh, drawn between AI practice in the material sense, um, energy, climate. The ironic thing is that a lot of these uh, climate models are uh, using AI technologies to model their uh, predictions. Um, also here, uh, consuming extreme amounts of energy um, requiring an enormous amount of data in themselves. Now we're not only discussing about AI and data or the technology itself, but its relation to land, to um, environmental aspects like emissions. So what are the actual connections to, let's say, the physical environment that this technology is also creating? And there I would like to um, lead over to you, Max, because I um, stumbled upon an article from you in the AI magazine that you wrote about human intelligence and artificial intelligence. And that the difference for you is that artificial intelligence is not an embodied intelligence, whereas the human intelligence is embodied um, in our bodies and thereby constantly trying to uh, learn how humans can survive. You're making a very distinct uh, difference between um, the embodied <laughs> intelligence and the non-embodied uh, intelligence. This is really um, something that is uh, so clear as a, a differentiation because now we also heard about how it could actually potentially interlink. I thought this was quite provocative of you to draw a very distinct uh, difference. Well, well I'm, I'm, I'm happy it sounds provocative. That, that was my aim. Thank you. Uh, well, I think, I mean, um, you could also exchange the term of embodied or disembodied by whether can it die? Is it able to die or not? And I mean, that's for me is the origin of, of all our so-called intelligent behavior. I mean, intelligent behavior is everything we do to uh, sustain our body, to, to keep it alive and to uh, to keep it in a balance where it has enough um, nu nutrients and so on. If we were not able to die, we would just stay on the ground where we were born and enjoy life just like algae do it. Algae are very smart. So so are we really intelligent because we have to move? I mean, where, wherever we would just sit down, we would die after a few days if you would, wouldn't do anything else. And this is something that an AI cannot feel. This is the, the core point from where you can give it a sense to have a better option to survive in the, in the, in the future, whether it's getting some food or just getting some reputation and a social status, which is also very important to sustain in, in society. And, and this is something which people are trying to 
to program it into AI. I think even like 12 years ago, I found a beautiful paper saying, here is a mathematical model for consciousness. And it was 10 pages and in, it was supposed there's the, the secret to consciousness inside uh, lifted by mathematics. And I think this is tech solution is to dreaming. Um, I think it's like, if, if you want to learn something about the world, you have to engage with the world with the body. And if you have, if somebody is staying in a prison, and wants to learn about the world, you have to bring a lot, a lot of data to that person so it can keep up with, with what is going on in society. Coming back to the question of extractionism, that's why is AI is so addicted to data, because no matter how much data it will receive, it m might get closer to, to 100% human behavior, but like a mathematical asymptote, infinitely get closer, but there will always stay a distance between humans and artificial intelligence. And inside this small distance, the worst nonsense can will still be possible, like AI extincting the world. And that's why we need to bring it so much data and so much more and more data. And if, if we want to stop with this, well, we need to give it a body instead. And that's where we come to Frankenstein and so on, which has other implications. To follow up uh, here on this um, distinction between the, the bodyless AI and the embodied AI, um, you got very interested with this um, horse, this so-called intelligent horse that actually was a real horse uh, um, and then you recreated it artificially. Um, I, I would be curious to uh, know more what um, kind of interested you in this horse and what this work for you is trying to tell about our beliefs of AI or about the functions. In, with this horse there you can tell so much about AI because uh, first of all there's something standing there everybody's like wow this can know everything it's the perfect solution machine you just ask it a question it can answer anything no matter how we don't understand how it works but just trust it and so uh, on the other hand side of course as I explained with this clever Hans effect it knows nothing about the world out of the many things that clever Hans could perform 100 years ago, we took one special task, which is guessing a number on your mind. And people can stand in front of this horse, they can think of a number from four to 10, and the horse will stomping its foot to indicate the number. And when you're thinking of an eight, the horse would stomp eight times and stop in the best case. We have a, like a accuracy of maybe 20 to 30% on a lucky day. It's already significant. But it's it's uh, far from like hitting all the time. How does the horse do it? Of course, it cannot look into your brain. And people 100 years ago, they were thinking maybe the horse can hear our thoughts. Maybe they're audible and the horse has bigger ears. So our ears are too small to hear it. No, the horse was just looking at your face. The horse knew while the horse was counting, your body tension was rising. And in that moment when the horse like caught you with the right number, the tension would fall off. But so small that nobody else could see it. Only the horse would know because the horse was trained on it because the horse knows if it hits that moment it will get a carrot or a sugar or whatever the horse is not knows nothing about the world but it's looking for a small movement and we never know if an ai for example needs to identify pictures of trains we don't know what it looks for how, how a train looks for the ai and it often turns out it just look for the railway because railway is easy to identify and so it, it sums up this, this black box problem. And also it's a very easy interactive way to deal with an AI. There's an embodied AI that you can directly interact. You can try to, to, to cheat it. You can give it even uh, wrong cues in order to make it learn the wrong stuff. You, so that is even a chance to fight back with against AI if you want and to destroy our installation. And it's, if you know a lot about AI, we you, you, you can discuss uh, with everyone about the model behind it, which I'm not an uh, expert for. But also, if, if there's just little children, they can just also play with the horse and they understand it immediately and it's fun for them. So there's there's a lot you can tell about AI with this very rather simple setup. That's, that's what I like about the project. What I uh, really like about this work is that it's um, on one side ironic. Um, but on the other side, it's also playing a lot with um, making belief. And uh, I think there's a, a lot um, around AI that um, is around, do we believe it or not? Uh, uh, do we want AI to to do this or not? Um, it's, it's often a matter of belief. And there was recently an article that uh, humans are actually quite skeptical about AI and yeah. um, they trust it more if they believe in God. <laughs> and if they think of God, they would trust the AI more, which I think is very interesting, like the concept of 
believing in um, in and trust and um, building a relation to AI. And um, maybe, um, Cara, that's uh, a, a link to your work because you're also working a lot on um, an uh, aspect of trust uh, in the context of AI, trust and safety. And I would be super curious to, to know more um, what is your concept of trust in this context of um, indigenous communities and AI. And you also mentioned the sacredness and the rituals. So I imagine there is also a kind of a spiritual connection When I first started the postdoc in trustworthy infrastructures, I was like, I can't think about from an indigenous perspective without going to the source, which is territory, which is sacred. When thinking about trust, the essences, relationality, building relations, um, and thinking about how those relations are sacred and what does sacred mean. And I try to, when it becomes um almost existential there's this kind of uh, tension that develops and then i have to take a beat take a step back take a pause and return to territory return to um cosmologies and i feel like the knowledge that's already embedded within my body as well like that is sacred and from there and through that acknowledgement between myself and one other where whether again it's cosmological um in essence or a human being um is sacred and relational so that has to be echoed back there's this reciprocity um in terms of thinking about that online or through technology it feels quite impossible but one question that it's is consent and permission That rather than AI asking or a technology asking if I consent of data collection or something, we are asking the question of what to ask an indigenous elder for consent or for permission to be on territory, um, to uh, plant seeds. And in order for that kind of permission or consent that question to be asked from an AI agent, there has to be a kind of trust, but that trust again is built through relationality and relations. So full circle. Yeah, I um, also read in a provocation that you wrote in June, um, what I found interesting, um, when AI is mim mimicking our indigenous relationships, how we archive, how we relate to land, the cosmos, how we tell a story. How do we teach AI about indigenous sacredity without allowing it to appropriate it further? So how do you actually make it knowledgeable to an AI without extracting or exploiting all the knowledge into the AI? Could you tell us more how you get to this question <laughs> and how are you working with it? Yeah, I mean, how I get to that question, I think that's kind of intuitive feeling based a process um in the process of actually um and what i mean by in the process of is also something that i'm asking by working with indigenous communities and honestly there's no answer but i think it's in the community and encounter through conversation and again ritual is where we are able to imagine what it would be like to work with an AI agent in a way that doesn't appropriate indigeneity in general, you know, but I'm really not sure if that is possible. I feel like that question or that idea has a sense of purity and that concept of the pure is very settler colonial. And I want to avoid that. So I think the next step would be asking how to work with an AI that doesn't um, dominate what it's possibly appropriating, because it might be impossible to not appropriate in some ways based on its positionality and situatedness. Maybe um, using your um, met metaphor, uh, Mark, that you uh, brought in earlier, um, data as a magnifying lens and mirror, um, do you also see this um, 
kind of thread in AI that is kind of um, extracting all data and mirroring it back? Um, or do you see, is there um, an image that you also have in mind of maybe a mirror that has black holes that it knows about and kind of um, keeps safe? <laughs> um, AI only looks for something which is written on the internet in most cases or is recorded as an image or something. 99% of reality is not, not accessible to AI. And even the stuff that we upload somewhere in the back, there's always some programmer who is like, okay, maybe they will find a way to code it in ones and zeros so that we can work with it because uh, nature and reality is so messy. If you look back five or 10 years ago, whenever you had to fill out some forms and you you really felt like you were working for the back end of the software because in the, the questions were asked in ways that you had to fit into the categories that the programmer had in mind before in many cases. Today, this is much more sublime. Just one week ago, there was a study about the political position of which you could interpret into uh, large language models. And they said this model is rather libertarian, this model is rather conserv conservative. So, uh, of course, not just what the, the output of the AI, but also the way it processes the information, it might already be put not like in categories, but in, into areas uh, which will never uh, be identical to uh, the brain areas where it came from. And so the, this, this, whatever we upload, it will always be appropriated in some way. The question is, could we instrumentalize this in a way, but while already um, formulating this question, it already has something like, okay, who would be that smart person knowing how to better process the information, which would be better for all of us or what? And so this is uh, the, the, the area where, which is very interesting to discuss, but where I don't know much yet. Definitely, there's a lot of translation going on um, from, um, let's say, experiences into data and uh, back. Um, and um, that's uh, something I would be curious to know more from you, Yasmin. As a curator, you're also translating um, the concept of AI into an exhibition, into an experience um, back so that visitors can actually get into the discourse um, around AI. And I would be super curious to hear a bit from your experience, um, because you also mentioned that uh, with this um, exhibition at the ZKM, you also had a focus on the exchange in the exhibition and also the recent exhibition around AI at the Hygiene Museum. Um, what um, maybe the reactions of the visitors were or what we were trying to to translate um, into into their maybe everyday environment around the concept of AI and what kind of uh, discussions it sparked. An important aspect to me when talking about um, AI coding new technologies etc is always uh, to bring it down to the bottom line of things and not to believe the hype and to add to this question of believing and trusting in AI what's important to me um, is to highlight these decision making processes that are um, supported by AI systems are presented as if they are neutral and objective and better decisions than humans can make. And this is quite a prevalent narrative that is out there that these technologies can solve problems to us, or we believe that they can um, solve certain kinds of decisions in a more fair way than humans. Um, with less prejudice when there are really complex decisions to be made and where uh, we as humans are perhaps um, a bit either overwhelmed by the complexity or uh, where there are just a lot of factors um, to the consideration. So it is an easy option to use these technologies um, to support our decision-making processes. Um, and by doing so, pushing away responsibility for those decisions. And um, that's, to me, really important to highlight that moral and ethical decisions cannot be outsourced to these systems. And 
because they are trained, they, th these technologies are not neutral. And that's a point that I try to highlight always in the exhibitions and the, in the projects that I make um, to explain how they are created, the whole infrastructure, the, the, the data, the ideology that goes into the creation of these technologies is not neutral. And so we cannot rely on them to make better decisions for us uh, on a societal scale. And we need to make decisions as to where we want to implement them um, because currently they are targeting uh, and they are used in quite discriminatory uh, manners uh, if you look at where these technologies are implemented. So I think people are coming to, to these exhibitions with a lot of preconceptions that they get from TV, from literature about uh, the capabilities that AI might have, which is oftentimes really beyond what is currently possible to do with these technologies. And um, to break down the narrative to sort of maybe demystify and to show the the workings of them and what it can and cannot do has been an incremental part of my work and um, the ethical decisions that come through the development and implementation of these technologies. Thank you for um, this um, bigger um uh, insight into your curatorial perspective onto AI and the kind of mission that you have in demystifying the AI and making um, the infrastructures and the decision-making processes behind it maybe more visible. Um, I think that's a good um, uh, maybe closing statement for our discussion uh, around so far to uh, close the the panel itself um, I thought it would be nice to get into decision making ourselves and uh, do a little game <laughs> uh, which uh, is two truths and a lie about AI um, so uh, three statements and one uh, is a lie and the other two are truth uh, uh, anyone who wants to start otherwise I would start Shall I go? Okay. Um, so uh, one of the first chatbots was programmed as a psychotherapist. One statement. Then the other one, an artist turned $69 into $200 million using ChatGPT. And the third one, you can insure your self-driving car against AI damages up to $1 million. What do you say? Uh, which ones are true and which is a lie? The one on Eliza is definitely true. I'm skeptical about, about the last one. So, um, Yasemina already says the first one is true. You say, um, uh, Max, the third one is a lie. Um, and I know why you said because the second one I took from your article. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. The third one was a lie. The first one was um, uh, Eliza, the first one of the first chatbots. The second one was uh, the artist Brad Mankind that uh, developed a meme coin with JetGPT. And the last one, of course, is um, not true. Um, it's maybe yet not true. I asked that GPT and it told me that it doesn't know yet about these uh, AI insurances. But what I found interesting um, while developing the statements, I thought it's so difficult to find a lie about AI because in, there's this concept that everything could be possible with AI. So it was much easier to find truth than a lie. And uh, that maybe leads also back to um, what you said, yes, that people who come to your exhibitions have these big concepts about AI and then the actual work is um, uh, maybe to, to bring it back to what is actually possible with AI. How does AI actually work and how does it actually affect our bodies and to bring this much more back into, let's say, the, the reality, um, rearm, um, back from science fiction and, uh, and these um, big beliefs around AI. The like, truth um, claim I wanted to, uh, to make is like, say, um, AI is a marketing scam and like we should call AI in general something else that is less confusing so that people don't have these existential fears attached to it that it would be more productive to talk about the um, 
ethical questions that we are facing today, because I feel like calling it AI is very distractive um, to what is actually happening. It's super interesting. I like this question of, um, is there an, maybe another term of AI that um, that also creates a different concept, a different narrative that we uh, and you as artists and um, researchers and curators actually want to address uh, through your practice. Um, maybe we can shortly open this question um, if uh, uh, maybe also you, Tiara and Max in your practice, um, have you stumbled about different terms or have you also been thinking about using a different um, word to create other images? In, in my earlier life, when I worked at the university and some uh, mechanical engineering institute, I think it was around 2010, we were talking about big data analysis. Hardly anyone was talking about AI. It was all big data analysis. And at some point, the narrative changed. This was when the first problems of and the first discussions became public about bias and stuff like this. Suddenly, they were like, hmm maybe we should not talk about companies doing big data analysis. Maybe we should rather talk about this miracle of AI coming to our planet and doing wonderful and sometimes horrible things. But I thought it was a smart move to call it AI because of, of course, also marketing for microprocessors and just to get a little bit uh, away from the responsibility of, in, in the end, just a big company doing big data analysis, what it is at the moment. How about you, Tiara? Yeah, I think the the failure of language um, is one of the reasons why I returned to the performance art. So the only way I would be able to reconceptualize AI is through my performance art. Um, I can't think of a better term or a better way than to be embodied with regard to the experience it creates for me. If I may add to this, I think maybe also because of our uh, obsession with information data and stuff, we, we consider knowledge as something which is formalized, written down. But I think any artistic performance is, is, is much more knowledge. It's just too precise for us to grasp it and maybe to tell it forward to the AI. But I think it's, it's even better and more precise knowledge. This is the real knowledge. Yeah, interesting thought um, that um, maybe we can enlarge it that not only the performances, but the arts in general, they create kind of a, uh, a knowledge that is not easy to put into language or words and thereby um, uh, a concept that is easily um, uh, fed to an AI, but it's a much more uh, complex uh, knowledge that uh, only can happen in an in, in artistic experience or translated or mediated through it. I had another um, question prepared for you, um, uh, which I would still be curious to ask uh, you. Um, what uh, was your first encounter with an AI? Um, can you remember this and can you tell us about it? When I was five, I saw the movie Hackers. And that was, I would say, my first encounter ever in my memory of AI was <clears throat> an experience of social justice using computers um, through coding and hacking. That's just the first thing that comes to mind. Of course, there are existential philosophical questions that come from that, what is AI? Is hacking, you know, working with AI, whatever. I think um, the second one would be William Gibson's Neuromancer and his introduction of cyberspace. So again, a return to technology and the internet Mm, yeah, it's interesting. It's like um, um, meeting AI through sci-fi <laughs> or through, um, through the fiction of AI, actually, or meeting the concept of AI, which uh, already was there uh, way beyond the actual technology was out. Exactly. Yeah, super interesting. Uh, how about you, Yasmin? Do you recall uh, your first encounter? <laughs> yeah, I think mine was at around the age of like 12 or 13 when I first started using the internet. So uh, using Google to look up stuff. Um, I, I, I can also reference a movie that made a really big impression on me at the time um, that was 
The Matrix, the first movie really opened up a lot of thought processes for me. Um, at the time, that are still um, really resonating until today, I guess, and have stayed with me for for a long time. And then going on the internet and looking up a bunch of like philosophical questions around our reality and the concept of reality and decision making processes. Maybe the generation after us have more direct uh, recollections of their first encounter with AI. Yeah, interesting. But still, you had like this movie and then the physical experience of going like um, online into Google. So, kind of a connection between the, um, a technological reality and the concept. Um, what about you, Max? Uh, I'm pretty sure I have no memory of like my first real encounter with what we could would call AI today. It was probably some boring search on Google Maps or something. Uh, but I remember when we were kids, I don't know, like 12 or something, and we were playing at a friend's house. We were playing with, I don't know, uh, Lego bricks or something. And one brother was sitting in front of a PC and he was like, hey, I have this amazing game. I was like, okay, so is it better than Lego bricks? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's called the 21 question game. So you can uh, think of something and this AI will guess what you're thinking of. So we tried it with the first example and of course it failed because the 21 question game, it had a, like a library of like 50 things it could think of. And so we had to train it and tell it, if you were thinking of an apple, what would be the question to identify the apple? And I always have to get back to this. And I later bought a copy of this 21 question game. You can buy it as a handheld ball with a battery inside. It's just fun to play with. And uh, you can train very nonsense stuff if you have the learning version. But I think in the end, this is, as how we approach AI today, it's still this basic model. You you start with a simple architecture and then the humans have to fill it. And at some point, the AI will always fail and then the humans have to repair it again, bring some new knowledge. And then everyone is said, ah, now the AI knows everything until somebody asks a new question and then the game continues again. So this is the one thing I will always get back to. What I found so interesting about your answers is that um, it immediately makes you think, what is an AI? So is it actually a chatbot that we used some days ago or some years ago? Or is it the concept that has been there much earlier and mediated through um, sci-fi literature films? Um, and there's something that is more about this bigger belief I ideology about AI that uh, yes, Yasmin, you were referring to as an actual um, decision tree making process and algorithms that uh, is much more simple and basic and just very recently out. And uh, uh, I thought that's uh, really interesting that it's hard to grasp when your first encounter was because it connects to the definition of what AI actually is. And um, Maybe a, a last question that uh, I'm also just personally interested because um, every one of you is working with AI and is interested in AI and um, um, had their encounters uh, with this concept and technology. I, I'm just um, curious to um, know more, why is it relevant to you to work with AI? When in your uh, professional or personal um, um, trajectory, have you thought, okay, this is really something I want to focus, I want to work more deeply with it, uh, around it. Um, when did that happen and, and what kind of triggered you to, to go professionally into this as well? I, I think in my uh, situation, I can almost uh, remember the day when it was. I was working at an innovation startup center. We were producing 50 to 100 high-tech startups per year which went out to change the world. Nobody knows in which direction, but we were producing startups for whatever sake. And it's like, I was I was thinking, okay, what is this all about? And what, why, what is the world that we are working towards with all these startups? And then because we realized, okay, technology is the thing that is changing the world. And, and we're producing a lot of technology and there was hardly any space for this debate on like, what, what is this? Or what is the impact of what we're doing? But also on the other hand side, uh, the, the the really interesting questions about humanity, like what is ethical, what is discrimination bias, that they were raised in, the, in this tech area about AI. And this is, this is what fascinated me that like 
I, I rather took AI as a vehicle to start talking about ethics and responsibility. I think there was actually there was one shocking moment, which was a conference 2017 with Elon Musk, Ray Kurzweil, 10, 10 of the so-called mega lords of AI or whatever, and they were discussing the potential of artificial super intelligence destroying the whole world. And there was like, yeah, this could happen. It's absolutely possible. And if it happens, well, we can't do anything about it. Anyone will be able to do it. And we don't know how to prevent it. But yeah, we're still working on it when we keep working on it. And I was like, what, what is going on there? What well, something is wrong in here. If, if we play around with something and don't care at all and just tell the public we, we don't care at all. And I thought this is where some debate needs to start. And I think this debate must be initiated by the arts because there are such universal questions that you can only answer with a universal language. And, and this, this must be the arts. Yeah. So it's very much about this question that you also um, brought in the beginning and um, how we take responsibility. How is it for you, Yasmin? For me, I think it started with a very simple question. Um, what are the determining factors that are shaping our interactions, um, the way we live, uh, trying to understand uh how our day-to-day -day life is mediated, structured, um, reworked through technologies. And I think what fascinated me most was machine vision. Uh, like when I first saw uh, images of how um, AI technologies capture movement, capture the body, capture vehicles, and what sort of conclusions are derived from those images. That really sparked my curiosity and attention. Um, and from there, I went deeper and deeper into what this technological vision actually means when it's used on societies, on people. And what are the control mechanisms that are exercised? What are the power structures, the hierarchies that are uh, behind um, these technologies. So yeah, I think from seeing seeing images that was uh, for me the starting point. So I read this in the statement of the hybrid biennial that you also um, uh, you were curious in exploring how AI can shape new imaginaries and uh, uh, I thought that's uh, quite interesting that you start your interest from the images that are captured through the AI and then thinking about uh, the imaginaries and images that can be developed through AI. Um, and uh, yeah, maybe um, you, Tiara, um, want to share uh, what kind of got you stuck with the idea of AI? Yeah, um, I mean, it all goes back to my childhood and, and seeing hackers when I was coming out of being a toddler. And kind of seeing how um, technology can be used as a means of like anarchy and social justice. Of course, maybe I wasn't thinking about this as a child, but it became embedded within my DNA at that point, I believe. And then a few years later, The Matrix came out. And this is literally what happened. I was eight years old. My dad had seen The Matrix in um, the theater brought it home on VHS and he was like, you have to see this. You're going to love it, but you have to understand it. We can't watch it without you understanding it. So we started the film and every so often, like 10 to 30 minutes, he would stop and make sure I understood what was happening. And he would be like, okay, do you see what Morpheus is doing now? Do you understand what he's asking? Do you know what this means? And that after the hackers was just like, you know, like it really stuck with me. I mean, like now I'm living in Berlin and I wear all black, you know, like, duh. Like there are other parts that have really, really stuck with me within my subconscious. And I think at that moment, I kind of became obsessed with this imaginary or this idea of AI and like kind of questioning it throughout the process of my life and reading Philip K. Dick and uh, William Gibson and, and just really finding 
solace within that or a sense of belonging and these mm, sci-fi narratives and then theoretically I really started questioning as a mixed indigenous person um generally speaking like how where do I belong in this where do I fit in why is there no representation of me like why are we only talking about whiteness or like the white gaze, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I can go off on that. Right. Because that's like my work now. Um, and that kind of propelled me forward, like taking my passion with AI or what was embedded into my subconscious at a very, very young age and started questioning my positionality in the world and how to use that as a means of social justice and assertion for myself and like the cyber feminist voice but assertion and accessibility for Indigenous communities um, throughout the Americas. So also kind of using your experience as a, as an amplified voice within the discourse of AI. So, um, yeah, I would uh, close it at that point. Thank you so much for joining this um, ride. Uh, we started very intense <laughs> with this um, focus on uh, extraction that just came up after uh, hearing your inputs and was a probably bit, a bit intense start uh, but then I thought we think we have a very interesting discussion um, about um, the embodiment of AI its connections and link to environment to territory um, to uh, its role in um, magnifying mirroring um, and maybe not being a neutral technology and then I really liked how we ended on this very personal note where you shared your uh, inner concepts and um, uh, meetings with AI but also why you're interested professionally in it and I, I think um, there are some some shared interests like uh, um, the idea of Uh, making the structures behind more visible and how it affects uh, different communities, bodies and um, humanity, um, maybe the world more broadly, because it's not only humans who live on this planet. And um, yeah, so thank you so much for this uh, really wild ride. And um, I, uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I did, certainly. And I have a lot of things to keep thinking about now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much for the discussion to all of you.